Greetings, family. This is Dia Nunez with the H Network. I tell you, this Mercury retrograde is something else. Tried to get on Blog Talk Radio uh, this afternoon, but I am not showing up on my switchboard, period. So we have taken a second route. We are now on Ovu. We are re- recording, and I will shortly download this onto YouTube. But I have to talk about this book with good friends of the HO Network, Rob and Trish McGregor who have written so many books, so many that it's not, I can't even count them all, but one of my favorites out of many is Seven Secrets of Synchronicity and Synchronicity in the Other Side. They have just come out with a wonderful book called Aliens in the Backyard. I'm telling you, synchronicity once again, talking about abductees, aliens, and synchronicity all rolled into one. So I'm really excited to talk about this book. Welcome, Rob and Trish. Hey, Dia. Hi, we're here. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, I will not be denied. That's why it's always good to have second sources of technology, and we will see what happens. But this is such a wonderful book, very, very fascinating. And it's it, it, the book itself is a synchronicity because let me tell you that the air of strangeness is a plethora this year. Um, where can one begin? But let's begin by asking why Aliens in the Backyard? How did this book come about? It came about as a result of a synchronicity. <laughs> Not surprisingly. <laughs> yes. Uh, we were contacted by a man, uh, Charles Fontaine, uh, <coughs> lives in Quebec, French-Canadian, who had had a very unusual experience in March of 2011 and, with him and his wife. And uh, it very greatly affected his life, and he was always looking for answers. And in the aftermath of this experience, he started encountering all kinds of synchronicities. One thing after another was happening to him, just unbelievable things. And one day, he went into, he, he works in Montreal, and he went into a bookstore, which is unusual for him because, he, as he explains it, he doesn't go into bookstores, he doesn't read books because his work involves reading all day long. And so it's not a form of uh, entertainment or relaxation for him. But he went into a bookstore, and uh, the only book he picked up uh, was the seven secrets of synchronicity, and uh, he looked at it. It had, it had sold to a French Canadian right. publishing it, it, it house. Was, it was a, a French version and edition, and but he put it down and left. The next day, he kept thinking about it. the next day. He went right back, picked it up, and bought that book. Started reading it, and was fascinated with it, seeing seeing how it was related to his things that were going on in his life. And then, so he uh, went to Google and put in. Google, UFOs, synchronicity. And what came up was an illustration of exactly what he had seen in his backyard, these lights coming down from something up above. uh, uh, Like nine beams. Right, right. And uh, he he said, uh, then he looked at the blog and he realized, my God, the blog is written by the, the people who wrote this book, and he was on our blog. And he, at that point, he said, i got to contact these people. And so that's how we uh, met Charles. And we, uh, and up to that point, we'd always been interested in writing a book on UFOs, but it's such a vast subject, we never knew the, uh, what approach to take. And then finally, we realized it was synchronicity, and we could work our way in, because uh, we found that um, many people have had encounters and abductions you know, start experiencing these synchronicities in the aftermath, and it uh, it really reveals that there's a mystical connection between us and them. Oh, no, you're absolutely right in nature. And I, I was stunned at, by some of the numbers that you were rattling off about, first of all, <laughs> number one, people who believe in the whole UFO phenomena. Number two... 33 million Americans have been abduct- abducted. That's a lot. Yeah, that's, they, that's the suspected number. They, they fit the profile uh, of <clears throat> abductees, according to a Roper organization poll from the late 90s. That is, yeah, that, that is amazing. And there's probably more than that, because a lot of people don't come forward. They're scared. 
But it's you know it's it's an astonishing number though. I mean I, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but uh, it it reveals that there are a lot of people who have had these experiences and you know keep it to themselves because uh, in the aftermath of after we we're on when we we're on coast to coast in the aftermath we started receiving some emails and people contacting us and they've never talked about it before with anyone, but it's happened all through their lives and uh, very mysterious experiences and. Uh, it's like a disease almost with them. <laughs> well, isn't it weird how people, um, Rob and Trish, are afraid to come forward? However, the whole abductee, UFO, ancient aliens is a part of American culture. It's like literally weaved into the fabric of popular culture. But yet you have this paradox, if you will, of people being afraid to come forward. Why do you think that is? Um, yeah, fear of ridicule. I mean, ever ever since Roswell, or probably farther back even, you know, the government has had a an attitude of ridicule. That's how they've kept everything secret. And uh, disinformation that has been put out there, it's just uh, a way of, uh, of, like Trish said, keeping things secret. And people are afraid of losing their jobs, basically. A, a lot of people are in type uh, of jobs that if they... Uh, were known to be UFO or alien abductees, uh, they'd be fired. Like Charles, he was afraid. Yeah, he works in the aeronautical industry. Wow, and it's the same paradox with um, being having spiritual skills, um, being psychic, uh, things of this nature. Exactly. However, in popular culture, you have all of these shows on the History Channel and other channels of the Long <laughs> Island psychic and all of these things. So it's like this dualistic right. world in nature. It, it, it's so, I tell you, we live in a world of contradictions because you have that, and then you have Hollywood like blowing up the spot when Independence Day, Battleship, all of these things. Right. But then, but then when you bring it to the real, it's like, okay, well, wait a minute. You're sort of kind of crossing the line, if you will, of reality, and we need to put you away. It's craziness. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> then you're a, then you're a conspiracy theorist, or you know, into uh, conspiracies in the in in the in the bad sense of the word that you're uh, you're making things up or you're uh, delusional. Indeed. And, you know, sometimes I, 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 I do guys perceive and I perceive this that the government does. Well, the, the world at large does this purposefully because there's like this reality going on behind the reality, uh, if you will. And I perceive that the government knows what's going down because let's let's call a spade a spade. Corporate America, Hollywood, and government are all intertwined. Um, and if, yep. you pay, if you pay attention, like when you see these movies and also the military complex, if you pay attention to certain movies that have certain subjects, they have like, you know, government uh, ties in order to do the movies so they can get things right and, and, and be accurate and so on and so forth. It's like um, this whole cloud of secrecy, if you will. And where, and by the way, let's just keep it real. Where did all this technology coming from? I know that the military yeah. complex is like experimenting with all this weirdness um, that's coming out in movies and so on and so forth. So, do you, what's going on behind the scenes, do you think, with the government and all this stuff? Well, you know, here, here's an interesting thing for governments that. Apparently, you know, that, that make their pu public policy is that UFOs don't exist and abductions therefore can't happen. After we started posting on our blog these stories about Charles Fontaine, we got so many government visits from Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Naval Intelligence, the FBI, and the Royal Mounted, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, because his sighting took place in Quebec. So, who, you know, you, you, you can't convince me that the government isn't interested and that they don't know what's going on. Yeah, and it's not just random people just taking a look at the, who, who happen to work for the, uh, those agencies just taking a look, uh, for a couple seconds or something or, or some automatic, uh, thing just, uh, threading through the internet looking for a Some bot. Uh, because, uh, for example, the, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they spent eight hours one day on our blog going over all of these uh, Quebec encounter and the comments, uh, comments, uh, uh, posts and comments, and um, 
probably writing up somebody was writing up a report for somebody higher up in the government from uh, what we were doing and what was going on. Oh my gosh! And that I was another. Know. That was another reason why Charles was very uh, wary about uh, you know having his identity. It, that's not his name. Uh, that's not his real name. He's hiding his identity. He doesn't want the government coming after him and uh, <laughs> you know finding you know that he's uh, been. Uh, you know, radiated or something, and uh, yeah, he, he, he and his wife both had severe headaches for weeks afterwards, and uh, exhaustion and depression. Right? Yeah, uh, it was a pretty terrible situation. I mean, he went through such uh, turmoil just because, because uh, you have to think about who these people are. These are not people who are interested in UFOs. They're conservative French Canadian Catholics who had never thought much about UFOs at all. They were something that were from the movies and television. And as Charles told me, I thought if they were real, the US military or government would have told us about it long ago. You know, kind of a naive statement, but that's uh that's how he felt. And uh so when this happened, his whole world uh Experience uh, his rea whole sense of reality changed. But uh, if I can take just a little uh, time just to tell his story, it's kind of interesting. So Indeed. one morning, it was March uh, March 2011. Uh, their dog jumped up on the bed at 3 a.m. and started growling and barking and wouldn't get down. So unusual behavior for this dog. Uh, and they finally calmed the dog down and uh, went back to sleep. But Charles got up at about 5 o'clock, and that his, was his usual time because uh, he drove from the countryside where they lived to the city uh, where he worked, and he took his daughter to college. And so typically uh, he let Spot out the, uh, out the back door onto the, onto the uh, patio to do his business. Uh, but the dog refused to go out, just wouldn't go out. So he, he nudged the dog out with his foot uh, and uh, then stepped outside uh himself and noticed these odd lights in the field behind the house so behind their property is a, a a farmer's field and he counted nine of these strange lights that they looked like uh inverted ice cream cones uh and they're going up to something that was shrouded up above that he couldn't make out and there was some kind of energy inside of these cones uh that seemed to be swirling and rising up from the ground uh in, uh, into whatever was above. And he stared at it in uh, amazement for a couple of minutes, two, three minutes, and he realized how he's got to wake up his wife and she's got to see this. So he, he uh, went and got her, and he was worried that when they got, got up back out there, they'd be gone, but they were, they were still there. And so she came out and was looking at them. And she, uh, oddly enough, she counted five of them. She didn't see nine. Uh, and they, were, they seemed to be moving closer. Then Charles saw a different sort of light right in the backyard. It was a, a vertical rotating band of light with luminous blue O-rings that were moving inside this band. And uh, then he saw that it was some kind of a craft because he could see a, a gray metallic structure outside on either side of this band of light. So it was like a UFO a flying saucer with vertical rather than horizontal moving between a weeping willow tree and the house right towards them. And at that moment, he turned to his dog to get the dog to get in the house, and the dog was surrounded in a gold light, and that's the last thing he remembered. And then he finds himself in the shower, taking a shower, washing his hair, and he has no idea how he got there and what happened. Uh, and his wife, uh, she, she's in bed sleeping, and she has a vague dreamlike memory of being floated into bed and as if she, she weighs 500 pounds she sinks into the bed and the bed just folds around her and she goes into a deep sleep uh, but oddly enough Charles didn't lose any time it was more like time was compressed rather than lost uh, he, kn he knows something happened but yet he was still able to get ready go to work and arrive on, t take his daughter and arrive on time. But then everything, you know, he started getting the headaches and he just, uh, his whole life started crumpling at that, at that point. And, uh, you know, from, uh, he, and from that day on for several months, he started experiencing these, uh, astonishing synchronicities that were related to this experience. Do you think that the government and these beings, which 
I perceive, and I'm not the only one, are many, are in an alliance with each other because it seems that nowadays with the technology that that the government is experimenting with, you can't really differentiate what's unearthly and what is. Um, I've spoken to some people behind the scenes that deal with the governmental complex, and they're experimenting with things (laughs) that appear to be science fiction. However, they are very much not. What is your take on on that? Well, you know, one of the women that we talk about in the book, Connie J. Cannon. She's been a, an abductee for most of her life, and that's her actual name. She's now 70, and she doesn't care who knows. <laughs> um, in 1981, she and her husband and three sons were moving from Atlanta, Georgia, to St. Augustine, and it was nighttime. They were on I-75. Connie and her youngest son were following her husband and the other two sons who were in, in the van. And I think just about around Macon, just south of Macon, she suddenly realized she was no longer on I-75, and yet she was sure she hadn't taken any exit. And she was on this, like, strange grid of roads. There were no landmarks, no really discernible buildings. And the next thing she knows, she and her son are on their knees on a tarmac outside their car, sobbing hysterically while... Several military men are holding assault rifles to their heads, and behind them are three greys, and overhead are several spacecraft with choppers circling around. And Connie is just like, you know, I mean, you, you, you can imagine what kind of panic state you're in. And one of the military guys threatens her. He says, if you ever, and then she doesn't remember what the rest of what he said was, And then suddenly, she and John, her son, are back in the car, and she has no memory of actually getting back into the vehicle. And everything else was gone, the military guys, the graves, the choppers, the spacecraft. Her son immediately fell into a deep sleep, and Connie, barely able to keep her eyes open, is driving aimlessly around this grid of roads again, and finally sees a convenience store. Well, first of all, you have to ask what a convenience store is doing on a military base. So she goes inside and explains to the woman that she got lost off I, you know, off I-75 and how does she get back? And the woman says, well, you, you get back the same way you got here. You have to go through the front gate. And Connie says, but I didn't come through the front gate. And then she realized it was useless to even talk to this, try to explain what had happened because she didn't really know. Now, keep in mind, she was driving a Regency Old Oldsmobile sedan with a V8 engine. I mean, this is a big car that was loaded with their belongings. So finally, she somehow finds her way back on the I-75. Meanwhile, her husband and other two sons are frantic because they don't know where she, where they are. They don't know where Connie and her son are. So Ted, her husband, pulls off to the side of the road. They wait, they wait. And this is in the days before cell phones, so they had no way of communicating with her. And finally, Ted figured, well, maybe they stopped for a bite to eat or to go to the bathroom or whatever. So he continues on towards St. Augustine. Connie finally pulled into St. Augustine three hours after Ted had arrived. And she was so out of it, she couldn't even explain what had happened. So there's a story where the military was involved. But is it a screen memory? Yeah, that's the question. Is it a screen memory? Because, uh, uh, for example, uh Seeing that uh, convenience store there doesn't make sense because there are no convenience stores on military bases. There's commissaries. Uh, so it's a, kind of an unusual thing that it it could be related to be some uh, screen memory that uh, may, made it appear that for whatever reason that the, the military was involved in the uh, abduction. We had an, another case we looked at where uh one of our other main, we had four main cases that we looked at in the book and uh one of them Diane Fine she uh she's a lifelong ex, uh abductee and one point when she was younger she was at a rock concert and she was abducted after the rock concert and she found herself surrounded by these greys and but not only that 
there was the the lead singer from the group that uh, she had been watching is there is there too and she points at him and says what's he doing here and they communicated telepathically to her and saying uh we thought you liked him and she she's really they see that she's really angry about that and then the uh the rock singer just transforms right into a gray it it wasn't uh, him at all it was just a uh, a screen screen memory or uh, a cover that um, is put there but uh you know i mean it's it's so so it's you know it can't be said one way or another about the military and the uh uh the grays i mean there's so many different stories anybody who says they have all the answers you know uh, it's just hard to believe uh, it's because they're just uh so, so many, many. <laughs> so many questions stephen greer uh who is big on you know getting the government to disclose uh what they know he thinks the grays are human creations and i find that hard to believe uh and that the, because the reason he's saying is that the 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 real aliens are out there ready to help us uh move ahead and with uh new kinds of energy to get off off oil and uh and into bas- basically a more ad- advanced world uh, and uh, uh the government is is blocking that from happening so you know there's so many different perspectives it's uh it, it's amazing well, and I have to say, and this is shady, but I'm just, we keep it real here at the HO Network. There's something funny about Stephen Greer himself. <clears throat> the fact that, um, he has connection with government agency to talk about disclosure. How strange is that? There's something not yeah, right. And I, and I can't put my finger on it, but it's almost like he's been, um, he's been planted, if you will, to put pe- things in people's consciousness, if you will, um, to do certain things. Yeah. So for in, in, deep down in my spirit, there's something about Stephen that is not to be trusted um, when it comes to you're that. Only, yeah, you're not the only one who thinks that. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, and you guys don't even have to comment on that. Um, I'm just saying that that's just how I feel. Um, but yeah. y- you know, but there's something there's there's strangeness about it. Now, I'm going to jump a little bit all over the place because Rob and Trish, there is so much to discuss on this subject in your book. I mean, you literally go deep down in the depths of Pandora's box. However, there th- the air of strangeness is like really unbelievable. Number. Strangeness number one, and let me tell you, there's about a million of them, and there will be many. Don't you find it interesting that okay, we know that we are floating in space, we're on Earth, and asteroids are coming close to us all the time. Isn't it interesting that now they're reporting on all these asteroids almost hitting Earth and this, that, and the other? I'm like, oh, wait a minute, why? What about the one that hit Russia? Hello? Indeed. <laughs> Yeah. And how could they not know that it was that big? Indeed. Yeah. You know? Indeed. Uh, I know, Rob's like, I don't know. It's strangeness. So <laughs> why are they Why are they all of a sudden reporting on these rocks almost hitting Earth? I mean, do you think that maybe there's... I heard someone mention on Coast to Coast that maybe it was, it's, you know... These rocks may not be what we think that they are, and they're intentionally being wielded toward us. I mean, it sounds strange, but, you know, fact is stranger than fiction. Hey, it's possible. Anything is possible. It's, that's right. Yeah. That, that's just it. There's so much we don't know. Indeed. I indeed. mean, we, 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 we as human beings really don't even understand what the nature of reality is. Hello. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We don't even know what consciousness is. You're absolutely correct about that. So who's to say? Who's to say what all this is? What were you going to say, Rob? Well, you know the the common thread that people uh, think about uh, UFOs and aliens is that they must be extraterrestrial coming here from another planet uh, and traveling great distances, but. You know, that doesn't really ring true, this nuts and bolts idea of, uh, you know, the, they doing the same thing that we would do, build rockets and try to go to the moon or to Mars or, and, but they're doing great, a uh, lot greater distances. It, it's something much more mysterious than that and, and mystical. It, it's interdimensional time travel. 
uh, it's related to consciousness. They're tuned into our minds. Uh, they might be they might be us from the future or it could be, or from another earth. Uh, it's it's just not so straightforward as uh, because that, that's the reason the skeptics always say, "Oh, this look, you look at the distance and how it would take thousands of years to uh, to get <clears throat> here, even if they were traveling at the speed of light or close to the speed of light or even faster than the speed of light." Uh, so it's impossible. But uh, I don't think that's that's. Uh, the way it works. I, that, that's what's going on. It's, it's something much more mysterious. Much they're tied in with our uh, our, our consciousness. Well, you know, Coming it's through, in, uh, you, no. You're you're absolutely correct. Um, in nature, I think it's very multidimensional. In nature, it could be all the above. And what I think is interesting right. okay. <laughs> about this reality is that they they give you a little piece of candy and then as you're about to bite into like you know the, the soft center they <laughs> they pull it away from you i find it very interesting that nasa i think it was actually last year nasa discovered a magnetic portal or magnetic portals around the earth um right. <laughs> and things of this nature what do you guys think about nasa coming out with all of these that are in synchronicity by the way with shamans because we've talked about how the ancient ones and the shamans knew much and now scientists are kind of aligning with what NASA and other scientists are finding out about this multidimensional reality what, what do you guys perceive about that I think there's uh, you know there's a lot going on that we don't really uh, really comprehend like uh, there's a, a uh, secret Navy base in the Bahamas on Andros Island called Autec, uh, A-U-T-E-C. Do you, do you know, Trish, what the uh, name of that is again? <laughs> we can never remember this. I don't know why. Atlantic Underwater Testing and Evaluation yeah. uh, is what it's called. And uh, supposedly you know, they're just doing things like testing torpedoes. <laughs> when was the last time we fired a torpedo you know, uh, a war-like situation. It, the Korean War is the answer. You know, it goes back 60, 70 years. Um, you know, and so we're spending billions of dollars out there testing torpedoes. That doesn't make sense. Uh, the tongue of the ocean right off Andros goes down more than 6,000 feet. And, uh, there's... Like most of the base is underwater. <laughs> yeah, most, I mean, of the, most of the, uh, the secret base is underwater and they have submarines. And, uh, there seems to be, and there have been a lot of, uh, uh, sightings of uh, UFOs that have gone right into the into the water and disappeared. And uh, w uh, one of the people who write about Bruce Gernon uh, had an experience, uh, you know, a Bermuda Triangle experience that uh, happened right off. He, he flew right out of Andros and suddenly sees this uh, uh, almond-shaped cloud in front of him that kind of looks like a UFO, but it's a cloud. And uh, he called it a lenticular cloud, but lenticular clouds are seen above mountains and high altitudes, and this was just like a thousand feet above the ocean. And so he flies around this strange cloud. And he's with his father and another uh, another friend, and they were looking for real estate in Andros. Right, yeah. And uh, so then he they fly past it, and he looks back, and suddenly this cloud is chasing them. This cloud is building, expanding, shooting out arms on either side, and it's going up. They climb up, and it's going as fast as they're going. They're going 180 miles an hour, and this uh, cloud is pacing them. It surrounds them. They break out of it, surrounds them. They finally break out of it, and then they see another one identical like it coming right at them in front of them and pushing out extending arms on either side of it, connecting with the arms of the other cloud that they passed uh, that you know, is also continuing to expand and forming a big donut. And they're in this 15-mile donut hole, 15-mile diameter donut hole, and they can't get out. It, this cloud goes up like 60,000 feet, and it comes right out of the ocean. They can't go over it. They can't go under it. But they finally spot an opening where two of the arms are coming together, forming like a tunnel. And so they said, "Let's let's try to get out of here." And they they flew right in, uh, into it. And there's swirling uh, clouds, uh, strange swirling clouds inside of it that are rotating uh, counterclockwise. And they suddenly they they feel like they're uh, they're pressed up against their seatbelts as if they didn't have seatbelts on. 
they uh, they would be floating. They were they were weightless. Uh, this ha- and all the instruments, all the electronic instruments go out, and uh, they they think they're near Bimini at this time. And they get out on the other side of this tunnel, and, and there's just this milky uh, fog around them. And they're able to contact the Miami Tower, and the uh, and they ask for their, their location just to make sure they're near Bimini, where they think they are, about a hundred miles away from Miami, and. They can't find them. They should, they should, there's no airplanes out there between Bimini and Miami. Uh, there's nothing on radar. And so uh, Bruce's father just goes crazy. I mean, he's just uh, hysterical that, uh, what do you mean There's no, you can't find us out here? And then there's silent, radio silence for about three minutes. And then suddenly the guy comes back on and says, okay, there's a plane coming right over uh, Miami Beach now. Uh, and... Bruce says, no, that, that couldn't be us. We're like 100 miles away. And he looks down, the cloud cover breaks up around him, and there's Miami Beach uh, right under them. And so it, it's like they were teleported uh, 100 miles uh, right to, to Miami Beach. Uh, Bruce looks at it as, as uh, moving uh, forward in time. Forward in time, but I, I, I see it more as uh, teleportation across uh, space because we had another story of uh, somebody who worked for Autech in a uh, submarine. They had the, everybody in the submarine had the same experience that all the electronic equipment went haywire and all of a sudden, boom, they were 100 miles away from where they had been. In a minute. Ago. Yeah. Not in minutes, seconds. Yeah, seconds. Instantly protected 100 miles. So what is all that about? Maybe it's some kind of portal for between dimensions. Yeah. That, uh, <clears throat> You know where the uh, UFOs are coming through out there. That's that's one theory. We had a really weird synchronicity too associated with all this because in 2009 the History Channel um, wanted to do a, a reenactment of Bruce's flight. So Rob and I flew out with Bruce and his wife to, to Andros, and everything was very strange. Hmm. Yeah, we I mean, Bill Burns, they wanted to try and get on the Autech base. They had written to Autech requesting a tour. Their their mail was ignored. And go ahead, Rob. <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't uh, just, uh, you know, get uh, when they, they wanted to. Bill Burns, who was the, head, the kind of the chief guy of the UFO hunters in that uh, uh, History Channel uh, series, uh, he wanted to get an interview. And they just didn't get rejected. They just got totally ignored. No answer at all. So uh, we happened to be with them at that time when they decided to go to the gate and see uh, see if they could get in. So we drive up, uh, park, and then get out and start walking towards the gate. And suddenly there's this black helicopter hovering above the gate. There's a cop car comes and uh, 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 parks crosswise in front of the gate like it's blocking our way. And... Uh, so at that point, Bill says, uh, I, I, I don't think we better go any further. <laughs> so we, we, uh, we back off and leave. So move ahead four months in time. We're in Sarasota, Florida, uh, helping our daughter move back to college. Uh, and uh, it's a Friday evening. Trish and I decided to go downtown and uh, go into uh, a bar where there's having some music that evening. And uh, it's, it's an outdoor bar. It's kind of a friendly place. And uh, we go in there, and it's really crowded. There's, uh, it's just jammed. And but we see two seats on this high top table, and it's occupied by two other people. But we we get in there and take those last two seats, and the music is playing as loud and. Uh, order drinks, and then finally, you know, the music, uh, they take a break, and we start talking to the people across from us, and who, <laughs> who are they? But the, the, the man is the former commander of Autech who had just retired, and he was the commander when we were there four months ago, and so we got the interview. <laughs> <laughs> that we, is we amazing. There. Yeah. That was an incredible synchronicity. Incredible. You know, that's how we see these... Uh, uh, UFO encounters, UFO-related uh, thing, synchronicity being tied in with the whole phenomena, so related to the consciousness. Oh, absolutely. This Commander Richard, though, this Commander Richard was kind of funny. Um, we started. We told him we had gone to Andros with the History Channel. And he was interested in why they were interested in in this story, you know, in Andros. So we told him, and we mentioned 
Yeah, we bluntly asked him, well, is Autech, you know, I said, we, Autech is known as the uh, underwater Area 51. So are you guys dealing with aliens and UFOs? And at that point, he excused himself and went up and got another martini. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, and he, uh, you know, he, he didn't laugh at us. He, he took it all very serious. And he just explained that, you know, uh, what they do is uh, related to underwater testing and evaluation. You know, he said and research. Standard, standard, standards line. But then he said, we're, we, we're not involved with UFOs. But you think about well, unidentified flying objects. No, but unidentified submerged objects. They might be very interested in those. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's... Uh, he, he he may have given us a hint there possibly, but he wouldn't he wouldn't come out and uh, you know he was probably under oath to not say anything if he ever <laughs> you know, about what he knows about the the secret aspects of the base. And nobody on Andros will talk about Autech because it's the largest employer yeah. on the island. They say very little about it, and and people don't know about it. I mean, what we met one. Uh, a guy whose uh, wife works there, and he said uh, she's worked there 20 years, and he, he still doesn't know what she does. <laughs> wow. But you know, it, it's, found... it's very interesting that you say that because not only that, there are other agencies who have contracts with governments, and right. they'll slip. And there's someone unmentionable in my life who actually works for a technology company who had a contract with the government. And this person accidentally slipped and said, oh, yeah, I mentioned some type of weird technology. And they're like, oh, that's not uh, that's not science fiction. That's real. We're actually working on that. And then they realized what they had done. And um, they, they reneged. But I still to this day don't know exactly like what they do, what they're I know that they have high security clearance, but I don't know what they do. So you're absolutely right in nature. And they'll go to the grave with these things. Um, well, we hope not. Yeah. One of the persons we talked to, we interviewed, we were able to interview a couple of people who were uh, former employees of Autech. They were civilian employees. They weren't the military. And one of them had the, what he thought, he believed was the highest clearance rating. But yet there was one building on the Autech base. He said it was dome shaped that he was not allowed access to that building and only the, the, the highest people up, uh, uh, had had access to that building. He always wondered what was going on in that building. Wow. Uh, I mean, there's so much, there's so much secrecy, so much going on, paradoxal in nature. Why do you think that we got rid of the space program? Do you think it's so we can go down on the underground and spend as much money as possible on these black ops uh, programs? Because let's just call a spade a spade. We are going to Mars, I believe, in 2017. Right. Um, so what is that all about? Well, how come, how come we, we don't do lunar missions anymore? I always mm -hmm. thought that was strange. Yeah, we were wondering about that recently, and here things have so, <clears throat> so are so much technologically further advanced than in the mid-60s, you know, uh, it's it's just amazing that uh, it, it seemed to be quite simple to go to the moon now, and we don't do it. Why is that? Indeed, indeed, and isn't it also interesting, um, if you do a timeline from the time, I think it's a hundred years that the tel it took for the television to come about, a hundred mm -hmm. years, and now we are in technology, computer technology. How is it, Rob and Trish, that every <laughs> six months we are advancing ourselves on a technological computing level? Don't you find that a little strange as well? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing to think our daughter, who is 23 years old, has never lived in a world without cell phones, Wi-Fi, Internet, you know, all the things that have come into being in our lifetimes. Yeah, and uh, I remember when she was 9 or 10, she saw a manual typewriter, and she said, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, indeedy. And... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's it's strange. It, it, it's strange weirdness, Rob and Trish. It's like, where's all this technology coming from? How is it possible? 
um, that technology speeds up every six months. So you're telling me now we're we're all Einsteins, you know, people in industry are all Einsteins and they're commuting, you know, c- computing these things um, at at a very high rate. There is just it's high weirdness. And another thing of high weirdness, isn't it strange? And this has been around for a very long time. Number one, the Vatican, uh, the Pope, all of a sudden is like, yo, I'm breaking out. I'm I'm I'm, I'm resigning, yep. which does not happen, honey. That has not happened in 500 years. And number two, isn't it right. strange that uh, the Vatican has a Vatican observatory and that they have the what is it? The V A T T Vatican Advanced Technology. And I quote, working for science and for the Catholic Church. And I'm like. For the Catholic yeah. Church in science, <laughs> um, what is this all about? What, are the, what do you think that they're looking out for? What are they looking to the skies for? If biblically they say that to look out there is Luciferian or demonic, but here they are with an observatory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Vatican, you know, is is a world unto itself, and as secretive as the as the government. More secretive. Yeah, more secretive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, all these connections are are out there, and we wonder where where things are headed. How how much further are we going to advance technologically before something happens, uh, dramatically changing everything? Like uh, it may be a repeat of what happened in the past. Possibly, we were at a very high state of technology at a, a time in the distant past, ten or fifteen thousand years ago, that completely vanished. Uh, all we have is legends and myths about. Uh, uh, Atlantis, Lemuria, and uh, that was more than ten thousand years ago. Wasn't it? I don't know. Well, anyway, it was a long time ago, right. <laughs> and uh, just completely vanished uh, from reality, and we uh, went back into uh, a primitive state and built up uh, again, and slowly, and then very rapidly in the last uh, you know, hundred years, fifty years, especially. And uh, where where is it heading now? That's that's are we going to survive this time? Uh, no, you're absolutely right, and it makes you wonder what is an institution, a religious quote unquote institution, doing, looking to the cosmos, and then not on, uh, not only that, but making a public statement. Oh, if aliens or ETs were to land, we would welcome them, we would baptize them. What? Right, right. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I'm kind of wondering if not if all of this stuff with Hollywood and the movies and books, if it's all leading towards a disclosure and a present you know and i think uh, they're they're not really going to be really any disclosure until it just becomes obvious that they are here uh like right. with uh thousands of crafts above the cities or or very or a few very large crafts above uh major cities that it's just no further I mean, we've had mass sightings, but all those have been written off as... Yeah, it's because it's amazing that uh, the way uh, we can just... There can be all of these mass sightings, and just uh, it, they still get written off, and, uh, you know, it's... There's still... Uh, the if You look at the mainstream science and the government and the military, they're, they're not here, you know. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, and, but yet, the uh, majority of the people have had some kind of experience, or, or they at least have a belief that yes, uh, they are here, or that we've been visited. You're absolutely right. I think that they've always been here. And me personally, I think it'd be hell and high water before the government, the government or the president gets on television, um, to admit. Right. However, <laughs> however, they'll throw us little bones and tease us here, tease us right. there. And it's like Rob says, we'll one day wake up one day. It'd be just like Independence Day and there will be like ships all over the place or one huge ship or whatnot, yeah. whatever. I really, really believe that. Yeah. Well, I mean, even with the Phoenix sightings, you know, the guy who was the governor at that time, if you remember, he held that press conference afterwards. This was at Fife Symington, and one of his aides was wearing a space alien costume, and yet, you know, sort of making well, that sort of, he was ridiculing the whole thing. And yet, after he was out of office, ten years later, he admitted that he had seen the lights himself, and he was a former uh, Air Force pilot, so he knew the difference. 
And then you have people like Colonel, retired Colonel uh, John Alexander, who's kind of a middle of the road character who believes in UFOs, uh, and has, has a book out about, uh, UFOs, and he worked in the military and the government, uh, 35, 40 years, secret projects and that. Uh, but yet he says, oh, there's already been disclosure. We, we know everything is known. So, uh, that, what the government knows has been, has been already, uh, released. And so you, you have to wonder what his role in all of this is. You know, how much, uh, you know, is he, is he hiding and, how much is he just, uh, you know, uh, providing some possible disinformation on the subject? So it's uh, it's interesting. It is, and you know, I really wish. I believe, if if I'm not mistaken, Buzz Aldrin, um, the astronaut. Uh, yeah. I really wish these astronauts, because if anyone has any, the 411 on what's going on out there, because they've literally, they're like the only, well, for all we know, have left the planet and seen the third rock from the sun from a different perspective, I really wish these astronauts would come forward um, and really talk about their experiences because when you read the accounts of them physically leaving the planet and some of the psychological things that they go through, the ecstasy of consciousness, I find that to be quite fascinating. But then again, I know that some of them may be afraid because they might disappear. They're giving too much information. But I, right. I, would, I would love... To to hear from astronauts who have actually left the planet. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Edgar Mitchell actually lives in South Florida. And, I mean, he, you know, he's come right out and says UFOs exist. Yeah. Hmm. And he saw them while he was up there. You know, it's it's a shame, though. I, again, it's this cloud of ridicule that hangs over people. Indeed, indeed, it, it does. It's a paradox. I don't understand. And w one thing that I don't understand as well is this propaganda of, okay, I'm going to show you a little bit, but then I'm going to show you the negative side of these mm -hmm. beings. Why is it that Hollywood is always showing it from the negative perspective. I mean, come on, you guys. If there's many different races here, which many people have said, they can't all be the same. So why are they portraying them in this negative perspective, if you will? Well, you know, even the researchers were really are really divided on that. Uh, John Mack, who was the, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, he came to believe that the abduction experience was ultimately a positive thing because it resulted in an expansion of consciousness. David Jacobs, a historian uh, and professor of history at Temple University, however, has the exact opposite. He feels that there's an actual breeding program that's underway with the graves. Yeah, uh, and Whitley Strieber is kind of in the middle. He uh, has said that it's positive uh, sometimes and negative other times, and uh, and he's not uh, certain exactly what it is uh, that has, he's, he's experienced. And so he's not someone who is uh, you know, making any definitive statements that they're from their extraterrestrials from another planet or or what they are. Uh, I think he's more of the uh, mindset that it's. Uh, connected somehow with our unconscious minds with consciousness yes I mean, maybe it's all the above, um, because yeah. they're, they're positive and there's negative. Exactly. I mean, look at the strangeness yeah, think... of missing persons, Rob and Trish. I was reading some information right. on missing persons just in one specific geographic, and that's national parks. Do you know that in national parks, there are more people who get abducted or get like taken away mysteriously than anywhere else? And if wow. They, if they find their bodies, like the weirdness continues, like their feet will be missing. Um, I was listening to someone the other day and they were talking about how, like on the reservation, um, in certain places in Canada, because you know that our, our native Turtle Island brothers and sisters have a real deep connection with the, the extraterrestrial. It's a part of their history. Um, how people would mysteriously disappear and if they would re 
reappear, their bodies would be here, but their feet would be gone. Like, you know, what is the strangeness? Oh my God. Of, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's very, very fascinating. So, I mean, maybe it's all the above, you all. Exactly. I think, you know, it's, it's not a, a monolithic thing of one, one uh, alien race that is here. I think there are many different types. I think there are very advanced uh, spiritual beings that are among them. And then there's uh, more robotic type um, beings uh, maybe that don't have any uh, concern for us one way or another. And then uh, there could be some maybe reptilian type that are, uh, you know, doing everything they could possibly do to uh, see, see the end of uh, the human race to take over the planet. I don't know. It's, you know, it's just... Uh, theory is just uh, speculation but uh, but that's think, the thing nobody really knows right yeah. you know you have all these theories and and you have denial from the governments and yet people have these experiences and you can't just write them all off it's, it's crazy yeah so indeed indeed I mean it, we were, go ahead Rob yeah we, I guess we just have to hope that we're protected by the better ones <laughs> <laughs> The more more advanced spiritual ones that are maybe uh, uh, holding off uh, some of these other ones, uh, you know, there, it, it's you know it's possible that there's a, that there's an intergalactic war going on or a war in a, other dimensions that are going on, and we play maybe a, a small role, a, a part of that, uh, a part of that war for this planet. Oh, you're absolutely right, and it may be a war of consciousness. I mean, we just, it could be all the yeah. above. What about the strangeness yeah. of, I'm trying to remember the time scale, I'm trying to remember if it was last year or the year before, where they they literally found an object be, behind the sun, and I ain't talking about no planet, and I've actually seen the pictures. Um <laughs> And I'm like, hmm, that's very interesting. We are having a galactic alignment. Um, you know, what's that little black thing behind the sun and not getting burnt up? Do you actually perceive that as we are moving to the galactic center, because that's exactly what we're doing, the Mayans were correct in nature, that it's a portal and we're letting things in and letting things out? Yeah, it could possibly be. And uh, one of the strange things uh, uh, about uh, these appearances of UFOs is that at times they seem to be very physical and they're seen on radar. Uh, for example, uh, Bruce Gernon, after that flight he had, he went back up there, uh, that flight he had through the Bermuda Triangle. He took another flight uh, one month later with a girlfriend who had never been up in a small airplane after dark. So uh, what, he took her out to see the stars. They flew out of uh, Miami and uh, went uh, east, uh, and he ended up, oddly enough, he realized, at the very, very near the same spot where he came out of that tunnel, and when he, uh, he was, he, uh, he, he was just like he was, seemed to be drawn to that, uh, that place, and, uh, he, his girlfriend sees this spot, uh, this light in the distance, she points to it, and he says, yeah, w wonder what that is, and it's a, kind of a orange light, and it starts getting bigger and bigger, and it's coming their way, and larger, and it's, it's coming right at them, and he then it, he sees it as a metallic, definitely a metallic craft with a uh, like a bubble top on coming right at them, and he tries to maneuver the plane, but uh, uh, to get away from it. And but he he knows he he doesn't have a chance. It's coming right at him, and all of a sudden, just like that, it's gone. It just completely vanishes, like it went straight up or just vanished or whatever. And um, you know, he never been able to explain that, but it, it was very. Uh, uh, it seemed like a very physical uh, entity, and that and but yet. Sometimes uh, UFOs are, are seen, but they don't show up on radar at all. So there's a you know, qu uh, question of uh, maybe they can change the not only change their form, their physical or non-physical. What is the thing that scared you the most? about writing this book you all because let me tell you something um, <laughs> when I was reading this book I was like Whoo, okay let me put this down and <laughs> walk around splash some water on my face because 
there are so many synchronicities when it comes to some of the things that you were writing about, when you talk about hybrids, when you talk about the different races that are here, and how some don't care about human beings. Let me tell you something. The reality that we live in is very dark. You see, I mean, it, it is like, I don't even know how to describe it. Then you see, like you said, the whole um, robotic type of alien. You see um, eugenics going on. I mean, it, it, the the synchronicities and the connections that I made were startling. What scared you all the most? Well, I know what scared me. Um, writing about Diane Fine, this another lifelong abductee who experienced a missing pregnancy. Hmm. And her story is really disturbing. She had been, in high school, she was diagnosed with cystic ovary disease. Okay, and she was told she would never be able to conceive. She'd had three surgeries before she was 20. So while she was living in a college town in upstate New York, she went to see her family doctor because she was feeling so exhausted and nauseous. So he did a urine test, a pelvic exam, and he told her she was eight weeks pregnant. Well, he was shocked beyond belief. She was just beside herself, you know. So due to her previous surgeries, he said, your, your pregnancy is high risk and I'm going to refer you to a clinic in Burlington, Vermont. This was in 1979. So in the part of uh, upstate New York where she lived, there were no special major medical facilities for, for you know, high-risk pregnancies. So she and her roommate set off one morning to go to Vermont. It was a three-hour trip by car that included a ferry ride across Lake Champlain. The day of her appointment... Well, they left early so that they could explore Burlington before, you know, she got to her appointment. Okay, so here's a synchro. Everything's going along fine until they pass Denimora Prison and go to the small town of Denimora. Now, Denimora, since 1845, there's been a prison there called the Clinton Correctional Facility. Okay, it was a maximum security facility and employed convicts to work in the iron industry. But from 1900 to 1972, Denimora also housed the hospital for the criminally insane. So if you think about all that dark energy, okay, it pretty much defined the place. So they get just past the prison and this really dense fog moves in. And they can't see even a foot in front of them. So they look for a place to pull off and wait out the fog. So they spot this gravel driveway. They pull up it pull up the driveway, and there is this old barn that had been converted to like a restaurant bar. So the three girls go inside. They order soda. And Diane said there were a couple behind the counter. They were very short, no more than five feet tall, elderly, and friendly. So she sipped at her soda, said she'd never tasted anything like it, and that's the last thing she remembers until two hours later when they're at the ferry station waiting to cross Lake Champlain. They have no idea how they got in there. I mean, this didn't, this wasn't just the Twilight Zone. This was the Twilight Zone, you know, um, and how it, they, they were confused about how it got to be so late in the afternoon. So anyway, she gets to the clinic on time for her appointment, goes inside, the nurse practitioner examines her, seems really befuddled, calls in another uh, practitioner who also looks at the referral and examines her and announces, this is an unpregnant womb. Wow. And yet she'd been pregnant. Yeah. So she, now this is in the times before there was very much about missing pregnancies or abductions or anything. So about five years later, she had read her first abduction, missing pregnancy book or story and realized that's what had happened to her. Yeah. But there's more to the story, too. When they came back... Right. Oh, right. Yeah, when they came back, they were driving along, and they, 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 they saw the dirt road where they had pulled off in the fog, and so they decided to drive up there uh, because that's where it all started. They drive up there, and there's nothing there. There's there's no, no bar. No bar, no restaurant uh, there at all. And so that could have been a, uh, like a screen memory that was implanted there. It could have been a UFO where they were uh, taken. Uh, and, and and with just the appearance of what uh, would be like a, a friendly, you know, bar restaurant. It's almost but she like knows that that's where the baby was was taken. Well, you know what you you guys just said. It reminds me of remember the hollow deck on the star on Star Trek. 
where they right, were wa- right, walk into yeah. the room. Oh, yeah. Yeah, where they would walk into the room and all of a sudden the holodeck would change into like, you know, this yeah. 1970s. Maybe that's what it was. That's very fascinating. Right, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was an interesting aspect of the Star Trek uh, well, the weird thing is, not 12 years later, Diane was abducted again, and she was taken to a nursery on an alien craft. She remembers this clearly, where she was shown this sad, sick little baby. And she said this was so traumatic for her because the Grays led her to believe that they had some of her own children. And she said, is that a harvest or a kidnapping? Oh, my gosh. I'm, now, I found that whole story horrifying. <laughs> For a, Yes, that is very much horrifying. <laughs> and, you know, when to read your book, I'm telling you, the hairs on the back of my neck and my 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 hairs are standing up right now. <laughs> um, reading your, your guys' book, I mean, I was just like, oh, Lord. Um, it gave me the chills in many different instances. And I have to wonder, what is the similarities between all of these abductees? Are, because you talk about hybrids. Are they hybrids that have been dropped off here and then maybe they're being checked on? Um, is it something about their DNA? Like, what is the deal with that? Why is it certain people and not others? Well, that's a good question. I mean, that's that's the thing abductees tend to ask. That it's not like they're saying, okay, where are these guys from? They're saying, why was I picked? Why did this happen to me? You know, I was just out in my porch or in my car or whatever you know and then there's the question of are these are these hybrids or some of these hybrids on the planet now and what are they doing and what are they like uh uh charles fontaine had one experience uh probably a year or so after uh, more than a year after his uh uh encounter in his backyard in which he drove to a, or he was in a, the back of a uh, supermarket to where he had parked his car, and he was sitting there looking at the receipt uh, from the groceries that he had, he had bought. And he looked in his mirror and sees this odd individual coming up behind the car who is totally bald, dressed very oddly. Has wearing very, sunglasses, too, wearing, right? Wearing sunglasses, uh and his very thin uh, and had uh, pants on that were kind of like uh, what a baseball player would have on, but they're, they're kind of high, you know, to the center of his calves, and uh, the, his ankles are very thin, and he is walking in a like an insect-type uh, motion, that uh, very uh, unusual gait, and uh, comes around the side of the car, and uh, then gets to the front of the car and uh, comes towards towards Charles, and he's you know has the car going, and he wants to get away from this person. He, he first thinks this uh, is maybe you know somebody who's mentally retarded, handicapped person. The guy has like a dozen or two dozen uh, ba- uh, bags for groceries, and there's no way if he's walking that he could fill those bags with groceries <laughs> and carry, carry them back. And uh, then, then he, the the individual starts screaming at him in some strange language and uh, with a very odd voice. And he doesn't high underst- pitched, high pitched, uh, odd voice in a, uh, some other language. And he doesn't understand any of it. And and finally, he he gets out of there and uh, he. He, he tries to write it off as somebody who's just uh, handicapped, but he, he keeps thinking about it and thinking that no, this this might be this might be something else altogether, somehow related to his his experience. And uh, he's never encountered that uh, ind- individual again. But uh, he he was very shook up by that experience. Well, let me tell you something. I've met some human beings. Um, that I may think are human beings, but there's like a strangeness. <laughs> it's like when you stand next to them, you don't feel the same type of energy or any energy at all uh, Ooh, in yeah. their being. And you're like, whoa, what is that feeling? What is that energy? You guys have a section in one of your chapters called The Harvesting of Souls. What is that about, Robin Trish? 
that actually, a couple of the people we've spoken to have said that they feel that what the Greys are really trying to do, aside from having a breeding program where you can, you know, actually create alien human hybrids, is that they're 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 trying to get souls that they don't have souls. Mm. It's a sense that they are uh, possibly bio robots, and they they're very fascinated by our emotional life mm -hmm. and uh, and our attachments to things, to people, you know, our pets. Right, and the and the sense that uh, you know what they're looking for is uh, is a human soul. Um, that's even scarier. <laughs> you know what? It's very scary, and I'm going to, because I'm connecting the dots here. Isn't it interesting? Now, there's a duality to this. Technology is a wonderful thing because we're speaking over technology. However, mm -hmm. we understand in Western culture that we, exa we have been taught as a mass society to exacerbate the love and the use of things. Wouldn't it be interesting... If it was a planned ploy to get the population strung out on technology, and people are strung out because, let's face it, they stand outside of Apple and wait for all these new things and so on and so forth. Right. However, a planned ploy to get addicted to technology so eventually that technology can be implanted within them, therefore leading to eugenics, therefore leading to something that will replace the organic human being, therefore being able to harvest their soul for something else. Mm. I know, isn't that, that crazy? It's certainly possible, yeah. but, it's, but it's, scary. it's a scary thought because it seems plausible. Yeah, they're already talking about the idea of possibly having uh, cell phones as implants in the inside of your wrist. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's one step closer to that whole reality of uh, becoming, uh, you know, uh, bio uh, ro robotic humans. <laughs> And not only that, you guys, there, IBM is working on replicating the brain through technology. Now that's really, really freaky. Um, oh God. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, it would, it's, it's horrifying. And not only that, uh, you know, creating babies in the lab. It's like, uh, we really have to look at these things. And, you know, I heard someone say, oh, well, this will only advance, <laughs> excuse me, the human being, really. Um, because if you can sell a person on the block, they would, you know, you can sell everything because people, we as a society are so strung out on technology and can't live without it. And we have been brainwashed right. into perceiving that if you get too old, it's not good. If you have wrinkles, it's too good. It'd be like a whole world right, of, right. Sur it'd be a world of surrogates. Therefore, people will sell in to the artificiality, the artificial dream, if you will. And then they can literally do whatever the heck they want. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, these graves could be thousands of years old. You know that uh, they are uh, maybe from some place where uh, that the, the planet has just been uh, devastated, possibly, and uh, in looking for a new place. And but the, the graves, though, don't seem to be the ones in control. They seem to be uh, all, there. There's always. Uh, in behind the scenes in these abductions is a, a taller creature, spider-like creature almost, uh, that is in the background and seems to be controlling them. So, uh, so that's, that's a whole other scenario about uh, what they're about. And, uh, it's, it's and then there have been these tall, blonde um, entities that have been seen and involved in some abductions. Yeah, we um, our first chapter of the book is kind of unusual for a UFO book in that we talk about uh, going off to uh, southern Chile on our honeymoon and uh, just uh, following synchronicity, uh, looking for something that would interest us a little unusual. And we sat, we're sitting next on the airplane uh, next to a Chilean woman. She said. You've got to go to the island of Chiloé if you're interested in some mysterious things. That's the place where they have a ghost ship, and this ghost ship uh, is 
seen as real by uh, the people of that island, and they uh, and there's a crew on this ghost ship, and they come ashore and they abduct people, uh, and they're tall blonde people, uh, completely dressed in black, which made us reminded us of the you know the Men in Black saga, and uh, and then the idea of ghost ship. What is a ghost ship basically? Uh, for maybe for the people of this island who are kind of primitive, uh, that uh, a ghost ship would be more uh, something that they would see rather than a, a, UFO. a UFO. And so we got there and uh, we found a book that uh, that a researcher had written it was in Spanish, uh, had never been translated in English. Uh, but Trish grew up in uh, uh, Venezuela, and I uh, was able to read Spanish pretty well. And uh, we re- sort of read this book and read these stories and. Uh, started uh, doing some research while we were on the island there. It's just fascinating the, the stories of uh, uh, these people who have been uh, abd- were abducted. One man disappeared when he was 18 years old, and uh, his one day his he was gone for 50 years. One day his brother had, felt kind of homesick to their to the house where they grew up uh, on the island, so he went back there, and there was his brother, 50 years older sitting out on the porch wearing the same clothes he was wearing when he disappeared 50 years ago and he's uh he said he said where were you he said i was i was on a ship but don't ask me any questions i can't talk about it <laughs> wow and then another man yeah then another man uh went out uh was going out fishing and uh, going down to the walk along the beach when he heard this humming sound and he vanishes, and he's gone just two days. But when he comes back, he's got a scar on his chest, a huge scar that's in the shape of a hand, like a, a hand pressed against his chest. But a big hand. <laughs> yeah, and, and it looks like it's been there for years, uh, an old scar. And uh, and he was never the same after that. So it's just really uh, unusual uh, experiences that... Uh, that people are having on that that island, and we 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 think it's all could be tied in with the, the whole UFO phenomenon and abductions. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, but but with a different cultural perspective. Indeed, and you know, since you said that, I I perceive that the ancient ones now and back in the past have sent us warnings. I mean, for God's sake, um, the Renaissance painters were painting. <laughs> Uh, UFO ships and little tiny miniatures and be, and and maybe hoping right. that someone would see it. Then we had that we had the Aztecs, the Belizeans, the Africans. I mean, you name it. Do you think that they were we're not getting the right picture? We're like misinterpreting this information. What is the deal? I just wish it would come forward. Yeah. Well, you know, in Chile, I mean, it's all looked upon as you know interesting myths and legends. But there are people who actually believe it, you know, who have experienced things, who who have relatives who've seen the ship or met the the men in black, the crew from the ship. So I don't know. I mean, it's 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 very easy to write something off as a urban myth. Oh, it totally and is, uh, and there's just too many coincidences. What were you going to say, Rob? Yeah. Um, just uh, another synchronicity uh, related to. Trish and I just the the way we met uh, years ago. Uh, we uh, when when we found each other, uh, we were in a situation where both of us were fascinated by uh, these mis- mysteries of the unknown, uh, psychic things, uh, UFOs, and but we were surrounded by people who had no interest at all in these subjects and so we would be individually we'd be reading all these books about it but not talking about it then when we met each other suddenly we found somebody who had the same interest and which is fascinating and uh, for us and um then one day i said uh soon after we met i said have you ever done a Ouija board? I'd like to try a Ouija board. And so we went on and got one, and at first uh, nothing much happened. Then it started moving and moving uh, faster and faster and started spelling spelling out things. And we're, I, I'm asking, are, are you moving that, Trish? Or is, uh, and she said, I'm not moving it, and I wasn't moving it. And so we asked who it was, and so the message that we received was that 
it uh, was somebody named Adahi, A D A H E, and he or she was was on a a spacecraft uh, outside of Earth. Uh, was an alien, and so I at the time I was a newspaper reporter, and uh, so uh, I, I was skeptical about it, and I said, well, uh, okay, let's let's see some proof if you're actually. Uh, uh, on a spaceship, uh, uh, sh- show us yourself. And so the message we got was, go to the airport uh, tonight and look. So uh, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning, and we drove out to Fort Lauderdale Airport. This was at a time uh, in the early 80s when it was a smaller airport, and you could just park right out by the fence and watch the airplanes take off coming right overhead. And so we sat out there for about an hour looking at the sky, no UFOs, <laughs> you know, and we feel kind of foolish about the whole thing because uh, UFO are, Ouija boards are notorious as trickster instruments, getting uh, information that is uh, not not true at all and deceptive information. So um, it's late at night, and we have both have to go to work in the morning. So uh, I get to work at the I'm working. Daily newspaper, and I, I get assignment right away. I have to run to the school board meeting and call in a, uh, a story by 10 o'clock. And then after I did that, I'm really tired. And he says, "Come." The editor says, "Come on in, ex- uh, expand that story and get me get it to me for the second deadline." So I'm typing away in the office and finally finish my story, send it out. And just at the same time, the person at this desk next to me is finishing her story and sending out. And I, and I turned to her and said, oh, "What are you writing about this morning?" And she said, uh, the sheriff's, uh, there's a U- there was a UFO last night reported by the sheriff's office over Perry Airport. We were at the wrong airport. <laughs> <laughs> and the person next to me is writing the story about it, and it was on the front page of the newspaper on the, on the, across the bottom uh, of the page. And so that night, we th- said, well, let's go to Perry Airport. <laughs> so we, we went down to Perry Airport and sat there for another hour, and the, the airport is totally dark. It's a small private airport. Nothing going on there at all, looking at the sky, nothing happened. So, the, so we started leaving then, and uh, I turn on the radio, and I hear something unusual. I, I hear an old-time... Uh, drama on the radio, like from the 30s and 40s, you know, before television. Uh, and I'm listening to this. Uh, it's kind of interesting hearing one of these old dramas. And what is one of the main characters in the, the story but an alien? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just synchronicities uh, all around us uh, there, that, that whole experience. And that, that was that was our the point when we were just uh, getting to know each other. Just <laughs> each other. <laughs> so we've had this interest a long time. <laughs> well, do you think that, it, well, it feels like this existence, where we are in this timeline, is a synchronicity, and there are all these little pebbles that are dropping more and more and more, and I feel like, the, and I've talked to other people about this, like something is coming, something is on the rise, there's another the shoe, the other shoe was going to drop. What are you all feeling? I, it's like a culmination of many, many different things. Oh, well, I think I think what's happening on a on a the big picture scale is that we're reaching a tipping point in consciousness. Mm. That's what I think. You know, where consciousness, I mean, consciousness can only expand from this point forward. And maybe that's really what this Mayan end date was about. Yeah. I and, think you're absolutely uh, because, right. Yeah. And, yeah, because these, uh, these UFO alien experiences are all related to consciousness, uh, clearly. And, uh, so that it's, uh, something that, uh, Maybe uh, in some way it's, it's, it's all helping us advance as a race and that we're moving to, uh, to some higher state, hopefully. You know, we got to look at, look at you know, see something positive. Optimistic. <laughs> experience that people are having. Indeed, indeed. 
Why, thank you so much. I, I mean, I could talk to you all for hours. I mean, there's so many <laughs> things. so much fun. <laughs> I mean, so much to talk about, Rob and Trish. I'm so excited about this, this book, Aliens in the Backyard. Family, make sure that you go on Amazon.com and you type into your search engine, Aliens in the Backyard. And check out Rob and Trish on Facebook, honey, because they be percolating and doing their thing. And also give the family your <laughs> website, um, Rob and Trish, so people can read all of the other information that you give because it is quite fascinating and interesting to read. We'll give you the, uh, the blog address. is www.synchrosecrets.com and then forward slash synchrosecrets. That'll take you to the, to the blog. Yeah, and if you just go to the first part, synchrosecrets.com, that's the website, and then from there you can also go find the blog right. there. And we have uh, new stories every day that we put up. Uh, and we'd love to hear from anybody who's been abducted, had a sighting, whatever it is. Yeah. Or synchronicity. Or synchronicity, yeah, I think. <laughs> Indeed. We have to do a part two because, as I stated, there are so many things to talk about. And I love, you guys are such great storytellers. I love hearing about your stories. And, I mean, <laughs> some of them just make your hair just stand up. You're like, really? Oh, my gosh. So you have to come back and just... <laughs> To talk We'd about love all, to. Yeah. yes, talk about all of the experience is that you've had writing this book and so many things. But I thank you so much for hanging out with me once again. You will always be family to the H Show Network, and I love this this book, by the way. Well, thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. Talk to you soon. Indeed, have a wonderful.